question. I know why you called. The religious review in the Bible. That okay. was what I asked Mike. And I answered, and Micah answered you too. Where I couldn't stay in Johnny at first. I thought he was a nut. I mean, once I read the Bible for myself, I'm able to accept the truth now. All right. And it doesn't make me angry. I'm talking about the Lauren Hardy show on Wednesday. Don't worry about them, some y'all. Get off of it, would you? Don't dare do that again. Shut that up. Shut that up. Shut that up. As your pastor, I am telling you, please. Don't waste your time on Wednesday nights watching this television program. If you're looking for Laurel and Hardy, I left my derby and I left my cane, but I did bring my Bible. If you'll read along with me, you'll find that the persons who are making the accusations, they're really the ones who have a problem. I hear them telling you to shut up, that you're going to be embarrassed, and I even hear them flat out saying, I'm telling you what to do as a pastor. Give me a chance and I'll give you what does the Bible say. Always ask for what does the Bible say. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Word of the Lord. We're starting just a hair early tonight, so I hope that if uh, I hope you were, were watching uh, a recorded program of What Does the Bible Say? But we are live, and so we hope that you are ready for a study from God's Word. We always want to start off with our content information so that you'll know how to Reach us if you are in our area or you would like to have a Bible study. If you'd like anything that we offer to give away, we certainly want to make that possible uh, available to you. It's free of charge. Uh, it's just uh, all it takes is you picking up the phone or uh, getting on the email, sing it to us at wordmanlord at gmail.com. Or you can uh, reach me at 276-340-2653. Or you can... Uh, 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 call me at 336-394-5721 Leave a message there And we will, uh, we will get that If you are in the area You can uh, uh, meet with us At 250 The Boulevard There in Eden It's uh, right there across from the uh, Old uh, I don't know, Chevrolet Place I don't know what Chevrolet Place it, it is But right across from Chevrolet Place And we'll be glad to meet with you If you are in our area And so we hope that you will come And make yourself uh, available to us And We'll make ourselves available to you. We we'll certainly will be glad to study your Bible with, uh, with you. On Thursday nights, we have Bible study at 7 o'clock. And uh, we have been going through a series of lessons on rightly dividing the word of truth. And uh, really, it's simply some exercises that, that everybody needs to, to use in order to rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. Get out of the book what God put in it. So, and if you'd like a copy of those. Uh, simply say, I'd like a copy of all your lessons on rightly dividing the word of truth, and uh, we'll be glad to get that out to you. It's just a matter of you asking for it. Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. And so if you would like a copy of that, any of the programs that we do, any of our lessons on Sundays uh, or Thursdays are, are, are free, if you'll just ask for them. And we hope that you will certainly come and, and uh, be with us. If you're in the Martinsville and Danville area, we always want to put the addresses up for the brethren there. Uh, you'll get the same welcome, warm welcome there if you're interested in studying the Bible. A23 Starling Avenue, 120 American Legion. Uh, if you're in Danville, uh, and uh, you will certainly be uh, welcome there. You'll be an honored guest, and, and uh, I know you'll be glad that you were that you were there. You know, uh, uh, if oftentimes people are un uh, uncertain about what to expect when they visit the Church of Christ, and so we hope that you will uh, realize that we are easy to entreat, and we don't have really anything to hide. We, we, we're open. We welcome individuals to discuss with us. And unlike, that's unlike the churches of men. Here recently, um, I had the opportunity to sit down in a, uh, uh, a neighbor's house with the Wesleyan preacher there in Eden. And uh, uh, I didn't know, I, I assumed he knew that I was coming. But anyway, uh, he seemed to be surprised that I was there. But later on, I'm hearing that he is actually now saying some things that are not necessarily true about me, trying to uh, put me in a bad light. And But yet, I stayed and talked to the people for an hour after he left and openly let them openly examine what we teach and offered to come back at another date to, uh, to study the Bible with them. And uh, uh, I asked the preacher, his name is Lewis, there at the... Um, the uh, uh, I think it's the first Wesleyan church there on Church Street. And they're in Eden Church Road 
in Eden, and uh, I don't know that uh, he would uh, want to sit down again. He gave me his phone number. I'm going to call and, and make sure that, that we can do that. He said he'd be glad to, but something tells me that he does not want to be questioned. And so, uh, you know, we have to wonder why it is someone doesn't want to be questioned. But if you're, if you're in Danville or Martinsville or with uh, us in Eden, you certainly can ask questions. There'll be times when you can ask questions and we'll make ourselves available to you to do that very thing. Uh, we meet at 10 o'clock for worship. We have Bible study at 11 uh, o'clock on, on Sunday mornings. And so if you have a question about something that took place in worship, uh, when we ha- go into our Bible class, we'll spend all the time talking about uh, what it was that you have a question about if that's what it takes. And so we, we hope that you will... Uh, uh, Understand that we certainly want to be your friend. We certainly want to uh, make you feel comfortable, and we certainly want to make you feel like uh, you are welcome. And, and that's really our our goal when you visit the Church of Christ tonight, friends. I want to ask you uh, what it really is that's hindering you from being saved. Now, most of you people out there are going to believe that you already are saved. But I want you to consider what is the hardest thing that keeps people from actually obeying the gospel, which is what the Bible says you do. You don't get saved. You obey the gospel. Uh, what is the hardest thing that, that stands between a person and salvation? You know, there was a man named Agrippa, and uh, he, he was the kind of individual that had some things that were standing between him and, and salvation. And it was, you know, not really a pretty picture for him. He was really, uh, uh, he was really uh, kind of in a between a rock and a hard place. But the Bible says that he uh, uh, he called for uh, for Paul, and uh, he said, you know, you've almost uh, persuaded me to uh, to uh, uh, to be a to be a Christian. And then you have uh, guys like Felix, who trembled when Paul. Uh, spoke to him about about the Bible, about uh, righteousness and judgment to come, and uh, it was the case that both of these individuals uh, were not obedient to the gospel. There was something standing between them and salvation. What is the greatest hurdle that you have? I say that most of you might say, "Well, it, it may be faith." You know, we hear a lot about these individuals like uh, uh, like Bob Lawson and and. Mr. Serber, who are, you know, questioning whether there is a God. They don't know if there's a God, but you might say, well, faith is a hard thing for some of these individuals. Well, that may be hard. It certainly is what is needed. Hebrews eleven six. the Bible says, For without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So it may be that faith is uh, one of the, Difficult things for someone to grasp, but faith comes from getting evidence. Now you say, well, what evidence is there that there's a God? Well, there's a lot of evidence if you'll just look for it and see it. It's not very hard to find. The heavens declare the glory of God and affirm it show forth his handiwork, the psalmist said in Psalm 19. And also you'll notice that the Bible itself that tells us about God is evidence of itself. The fact that it's preserved written by uh, about 40 men over a period of about 1,600 years in three different languages on at least two, probably three different continents, and individuals from all sorts of backgrounds wrote this book, and yet it comes together in beautiful harmony is a testimony to the fact that there is a greater mind behind this than simply mere mortal man. So if, if belief is what's so hard for you, then maybe you just need some evidence. Maybe you need some evidence. Somebody might say, well, maybe it's baptism, which the Bible does say is the last step in in obtaining salvation. It precedes uh, salvation. It comes before it. Acts 22 and verse 16, uh, you know that here is Ananias comes to visit uh, Saul of Tarsus, who's been praying for three days, and he has been told that someone's going to be coming to tell him what he must do. And Ananias tells him, Why tarest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling the name of the Lord. So the last step is baptism. That is a very difficult hurdle for a lot of individuals because they say that it's a work of man. It's not essential. Well, 
Either of these may be hard for some individuals, but I say it's not the greatest. The greatest hindrance to individuals is not faith nor baptism. Faith is the beginning of a person's salvation, for without faith it is impossible to please God, as we just read. And if you are looking for the truth, you'll find it. Notice what Paul said in Acts 17. In Acts chapter 17, and uh, I'm going by, I'm having a hard time seeing my thing there, but Acts 17, and we're going to say about verse 25. Uh, Notice this, Acts 17, 27, that they would seek the Lord, if have they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. There is an abundance of evidence that is out there if you'll just look for it. So faith is not really a difficult task if you'll simply look for it. You have to have some faith that will look for something, that will work for something, for faith without works is dead. No one, no one is going to be saved without faith. You know, I hear individuals say, well, faith only. But there in John 12, verse 42, you have individuals who had faith. The Bible says they had faith, but yet they wouldn't confess Christ. So we have to ask the question, is faith uh, so difficult? No. In this case, it was confessing Christ that was so hard for these individuals. Among the chief rulers, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess to him, lest he should be put out of the synagogue. Believing was easy for these individuals. It was confession that was the hurdle. Standing between them and salvation or accepting Christ as their Savior and obeying him in all that he said to do, preparing for the kingdom that was to come. So faith wasn't hard, and baptism is really not that hard for someone who is sincere and willing to submit to the commands of God. You know, a lot of individuals say that baptism is hard, but it's only hard because they don't want to obey God. How simple is this? Mark 16, 16. You know, I recently asked a Baptist preacher named uh, Harry, and he preaches out in Madan or Madison, and this is what I asked him, uh, what is so difficult about this verse? I said in Mark 16, verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. He said, well, that's, that's kind of confusing. It's not real clear what Jesus wanted. And I said, well, how? I asked him back in a letter. I said, how much clearer could it be or if Christ wanted baptism to be uh, before salvation, how would he word it any differently? I've yet to hear back from him on this matter. How hard is it to say, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved? Understanding that a person is not going to be baptized if they don't believe. Why go to all the trouble to say, he that believeth not and is baptized not shall be damned, knowing that ba- believe and baptism go together? See? If I, say, if I say, he that eateth and digesteth shall live, but he that eateth not will die, it stands to reason that if someone is not going to eat, they're not going to digest anything. There's nothing to digest. So a person who does not believe, they're not going to do anything that follows belief or that is required after belief. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Both of these these elements are essential to salvation. You can't get around that. And baptism is not that difficult for someone who's willing to submit to it. Like in Acts chapter 8, there's there's the eunuch on the road back home. Philip is teaching him. And when Philip taught him Christ, apparently Philip said something about baptism because the first question you find the eunuch asking after the the discussion is being being, uh, uh, gone forth is you find him asking, see here's water, what doth hinder me from being baptized? He understood there was something essential about baptism that he wanted to be baptized when he came to water. Philip simply said, if thou believest all thine heart, thou mayest. And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And thus they stopped the chariot and they went down both in the water and Philip baptized him. See, it's not that difficult. It's not that difficult if you understand its its proper place. Now sometimes we're accused of emphasizing baptism too much. And maybe, maybe it's the case if we don't explain the proper place of baptism and what baptism does. But notice this, friends. The apostles didn't seem to think that baptism was stressed too much or that there was uh, uh, that you could put too much importance on baptism because notice this. When they taught the people, 
the people responded in like fashion. In Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 8, in Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 9, every time someone was told what they must do to be saved, baptism was always in the equation. You don't always find faith being mentioned. You don't always find repentance being mentioned. You don't always find confession, but you always find those individuals being baptized when they are told what they must do to be saved. When the gospel was preached to them, baptism was always included. So the hardest, the hardest uh, command is not to believe, and the hardest command is really not to be baptized. I submit to you the hardest command is, is this. The hardest command is to repent. And here's why. Repent, friends, is a command that involves the will of man. It involves you saying to yourself, it involves you making up your mind that you are no longer going to be uh, the king or the ruler of your own life. You're not going to be determined which way you want to go, do what you want to do, say what you want to say, act the way you want to act. You're going to submit to the will of God. And, And it is the hardest command because it involves the will of man. Man has a, has a will that makes him very, very stubborn. And God knows that if a person is going to repent, it's going to have to come at the submission of their will. Notice this in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse uh, 1. Uh, we'll start in verse 2. Paul is saying this. He says, but be sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, now he's talking to the Jews, thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things, that, and and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? No, do you think you can do one thing that God, that, do you think you can do the things that the Gentiles are doing, and God's going to condemn them and not condemn you? Or, watch verse 4, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Paul is simply saying, Look, you individuals who won't repent, you have a hard, impenitent heart, you will re- you refuse to submit to God, all you're doing is treasuring up. For yourself wrath against the day of wrath. You're just adding interest upon the wrath that is coming upon you. If it were money in the bank, you'd be rich. But instead, this is wrath that God is laying to your account, sins that are laid to your account because you refuse to submit to his will. That's why, that's why repentance is so hard. It, it involves man's will, man's determination to do what God says as opposed to what man wants to do. Now, I know, friends, you're sitting out there and you're thinking, you know what, I'm not stubborn. I want to submit to God's will. But the bottom line is, friends, if you are doing what you want to do and you're worshiping God the way you want to worship and you want to give God what you want to give and you want to think that God's going to accept what you offer him simply because you love him and you say you love him, you are stubborn. You are a stubborn, stubborn individual. You are rebelling against God because you refuse to do what he says. And here's what the Bible says about rebellion. Stubbornness is as idolatry and rebellion is as witchcraft. In 1 Samuel 15 verse 22, we'll look, we'll look briefly at this account, but look at this. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22, Saul has been told to go and utterly destroy the Amalekites, wicked people, and God says go to utterly destroy them. But what he did was he took the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the chief things which could, which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord uh, thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of uh, witchcraft, as a witchcraft and stubbornness as the iniquity of idolatry. Look, friends, when someone says, well, I think God likes my instrumental music. I think God likes it when I'm getting up here and dancing around and and, and we've got uh, young girls up here showing their underpants and we've got guys out here break dancing for the Lord and we've got people up here doing whatever they want to do, riding their motorcycles down the auditorium or we have, 
you know, uh, we have motorcycles for the, for the master or whatever it is, and we think God wants that. Look, God does not have great delight in the things that you offer him as much as he likes you simply obeying what he says. Listen, I have two children, and I understand, how, I understand the concept. If I tell my children to go clean your room, and instead they go off into another room, and they draw me a pretty picture, and they say, look, Daddy, that's a pretty picture I made you. Well, you know what? I like that. I appreciate the pretty picture. I appreciate the time and effort you put into it, but you know what really makes me happy? If you had just done what I said. I would rather have obedience rather than you simply give me something that you think will make me happy. Why not go clean your room and then draw me the picture? But simply do what I ask. God is asking individuals to do what he says, and instead what they do is they do what, uh, what he wants. I'm going to turn, turn the volume down a little bit. So what God wants is God wants obedience. God wants obedience. And the impenitent, the impenitent heart simply grows harder. It, 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 it grows more determined to rebel against God. Notice this in Hebrews 12 verse 15. Hebrews 12 and verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby be defiled, lest there be in any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one mor morsel so of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. See what happens, friend? When you have a heart that is stubborn and determined that you're going to do what you want to do, and you despise the riches of God, and you despise the mercy and the long-suffering of God, then what happens is there comes a point when you won't obey God, you won't submit to his will, and even though now you realize you need to, you're going to be so conditioned to do what you want to do that it'll just be impossible for you to do it. The Bible talks about individuals being past feeling, past the point of doing what God said because they're so wrapped up in doing what they want to do. Now, this may be difficult. This may be hard, but the bottom line is, friends, everybody needs to repent. God expects all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17 to verse 30. It's not a suggestion. It is a command. And so what we need to do then is find out what repentance is, what's required of it, so that we can do it. Yes, it's the hardest command, but what is it? What is repentance? Well, look at this. Repentance simply means to change after knowing. It means to change after knowing. Once you know and you realize where you are, you're going to have to change. And that's why it's so difficult because it, it involves changing the mind after knowing or realizing the sin and rebellion that you've committed against God. Now, I want you to consider this. Our Baptist friends and the Wesleyan friends, they all say that you repent and then you have faith. That's impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You cannot repent to God or repent toward God or repent for sinning against God before you have faith. Why would you change before you know what you need to change to? You see, repentance involves a change after knowing. Once you realize that you've sinned against God, that's when repentance steps in. That's the place for repentance. When you know, hey, I've been going the wrong direction. Look at this. In 2 Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we're going to start in about verse 9. Paul says, he says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. He made them sorry when he wrote them a letter. He wrote, he wrote 1 Corinthians and told them that there was a man living in fornication and that they were puffed up and they should put away this man, put away that wicked person so that his soul might be saved. That's 1 Corinthians 5. Instead of being puffed up, he said you ought to put him away from you. They did. They did that very thing. And then he says this. He says, I'm rejoicing. Not that you are made sorry, but I'm rejoicing that ye sorrowed to repentance. 
Why, why was he, why was he rejoicing? Because when they sorrowed to repentance, they were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. He said, you repented for the right, uh, for the right reasons. You repented in the right way. And now we don't have to come and chastise you anymore. Here's what he says, verse 10. He says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. There's a lot of people who repent after knowing, but it may not be godly sorrow. See, watch this. A man goes to the doctor. And the doctor says, son, if you don't quit drinking, you're going to die of cirrhosis of the liver. So he stops. He stops because the doctor told him to. He didn't stop because the doctor. Because God told him to do it. See? He stopped because, well, if I don't, I'm gonna, it's going to kill me. See? So, so he, he's repenting. He's repenting after knowing. He knows that he's going to change his life. But it's not godly sorrow. When you recognize that you are sinning against God and you're turning toward God after knowing that you're sinning against God, that's godly sorrow. That's godly sorrow that leads toward repentance. But the sorrow of the world work of death. It's not going to change you. You may, you may change a little bit and get on a different track, but you're still going to bust hell wide open because you had not repented toward God. Godly sorrow work of repentance. It's not sorrow of the world. It's not the sorry you got caught sort of repentance. You know, it's not, well, you know, we caught you cheating or you were busted cheating on your wife. So now, now you're in trouble. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, you're sorry you got caught. See, you're sorry you got caught. If you hadn't got caught, you'd still be doing it. Right? But godly sorrow says, you know what? I've sinned against God. David, in his penitent psalm in Psalm 51, when he is crying to God about his sin with Bathsheba, he says, I've sinned against thee and thee alone. Now, there were some other people he sinned against. He sinned against Uriah. He killed him. He sinned against Bathsheba. But ultimately, he sinned against God. That's godly sorrow. Ultimately, you sin against God. And when you recognize that, when you recognize that, you change. You turn after knowing. So repentance, <clears throat> repentance is to turn after knowing. It's not the Reformation itself, right? John the Baptizer said in Matthew 3, verse 8, to those Pharisees, he said, repent, repent and bring forth works or fruit, meat for repentance. You repent and then you show that you're repenting. You demonstrate it. You actually produce something that shows your repentance. Look what Paul will say back in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 11. He says, For behold this self same thing, that you sorrow after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourself, what indignation, yea, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things, in all things, uh, I'm going to miss my verse here. But the point is, Paul is saying to these individuals, in all things you have approved yourselves. What, what Paul is, is telling them is, you know what, when you repented, you repented with such uh, force, such intensity. You cleared yourself. I want to make sure that everything's clear. I want to make sure that there's nothing standing between me and God that there's nothing going to be held to my account. I have vehement desire. I'm zeal. I am making sure that my record is clear. That is what repentance brings. It brings a, a desire to make sure everything is right. So repentance, repentance is produced by godly sorrow and it brings about reform. It brings about the change. Look at this. In Acts 11, verse 18, the Bible says that the Jews rejoiced because that repentance, that God had granted repentance to the Gentiles. God had also, uh, to the Gentiles, granted repentance unto life. Now, that doesn't mean that God repented for them. That doesn't mean that God repented for them. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 25 The, uh, the, the man of God instructs in meekness those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging the truth, 
that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive to him by his will. God doesn't grant repentance in the sense of if someone doesn't repent because God didn't do it. That's not how repentance works. But God grants repentance. It is a gift of God in the sense of God makes it possible for man to repent. God commands men to repent, Acts 17, verse 30. So why would he command someone to, to do something that he has to do for them? God grants repentance in the sense of he grants the opportunity for them to repent. Look at this. Look at this. In 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what we're talking about. God is waiting, giving people opportunity to repent. It's a hard command. It's a hard command to keep. God knows that some people are going to have a long time doing it, tough time doing it. He is long-suffering. Now, friend, if, if it wasn't so hard, do you think God give you so much time? It ought to be the case, though, that the goodness of God is leading you to repentance. Romans 2 and verse 4, verse we just read, it is the goodness of God that should lead you to repent. When you think about what God has done for you, it ought to be the case that you are repenting in sackcloth and ashes. You are so distressed, <clears throat> you are so upset at how you've been treating God that you're going to turn and you're going to start serving Him. It is God's goodness that ought to motivate you to do something in return. It ought to convict you. You know, there was a movie not too long ago, or a few years ago, I guess, called, I think it was something like Pay It Forward. Someone does a good deed for you, and you then pay it forward by doing a good deed in return. Well, it ought to be the case that when you learn of God's goodness and what God has done for you, all the blessings that He's given you, when you look at, at, at the, especially folks in this country, if you're living in the United States of America, you may not have a job. You may be hurting a little bit, but you know what, friends? This country is the most free country in the world, and if you can't make it in the United States of America, you can't make it. If you're too lazy to get out and try to find a way to make a living, or if you're too lazy to get out and, and try to, to make something of yourself and provide for your family, then you're a sorry dog. But here's the fact of the matter is, when you stop and look at what you have in this, in this country, the freedom, you can go anywhere you want to go, do what you want to do, say what you want to say. Listen, that's a blessing from God. You ought to use it to bring God glory. Now, do you despise the goodness of God? You ought to thank, you ought to thank God that we live in a country where people from the, like, like those from the Church of Christ can bring you the pure, unadulterated word of truth, encourage you, challenge you to study his word so that you can learn his will and you don't have to worry about someone breaking down your door and killing you because you're studying the Bible. You ought to be glad you don't live in Iran or Saudi Arabia, some of these Muslim countries where you can't, you can't talk about the Bible. You ought to be glad. You ought to be, you ought to be so happy. See? You ought to be moved to repentance based upon the goodness of God. Now, that's exactly, that's exactly what happens. When a person hears the preaching of God's word, they repent. You read through the book of Jonah. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he knew that the minute he went to Nineveh and did what God said, started preaching his word, those people repent. He didn't want them to repent. They were Israel's enemies. Assyria was bad news. Assyria was the kind of people who would rip women with child open and impale people on stakes. They were bad people. Sounds kind of like people in the United States, I guess, really, when he gets right down to it, ripping women open with child. But when people hear the word, they'll repent if they've got the right heart. Tender heart will repent when they hear the word preached. But it's still the hardest command to obey. And one reason why it's so hard for men to obey is because it, in, it involves their will. It involves you saying, I'm going to have to submit. I'm going to have to do something and give up a little bit in order to submit my will to God's will. But Jesus did that. Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. 
Now, are you too good to be like Christ? Jesus submitted his will. He submitted to, unto the Father. Are you too good? Are you better than Christ? Yes, it is a hard command to obey because of man's will. But you know what? It's a hard man to obey. It's a hard command to obey because of all the hindrances. It's a hindered command. Listen, this is really, friends, when it gets right down to it, this is really where we have trouble in the United States of America. This is really where you, neighbor, this is really where you're going to have the, tr the, most t t uh, the toughest time. This is why a lot of people have trouble repenting is because it is a hindered command. It's a hard enough command as it is, but when you add to it difficulties, it makes it even more difficult for people to repent. Here's what I'm talking about. Repentance is hindered because man starts making sin unsinful. Now, why will you repent of something if you're not convinced it's sinful? If you know you've got to repent of your sins, you're not going to repent of something if man turns around and says, well, that's not really sinful. You see the problem? Man has a way of making sinful things unsinful in the eyes of other men so that no one says, well, you know, what is that to repent of? Tell me, what is a sin in our society? It's getting to the point now, friends, that you can't even find what a sin is. I think the biggest sin that, we're, that, that, uh, that you may see in our society is people like us telling you what the Bible says. And, oh, y'all judging, that's a sin. I think that's the only sin that anybody commits around here. And we're the only ones that's doing it. It seems like it's the sin of judging. Because anything else goes. But God forbid you get up and tell someone the truth because then you'll be judging. But all you're doing is you're hindering repentance because you're making the sinful unsinful. You look at our society. Our society makes deviant behavior acceptable. We look at things that are immoral and that are deviant and we say, well, that's all right. That's, that's not so bad. Oh, you know, you're just being a prude. Now, you know that's the case. You know that's the case. Society makes deviant and immoral behavior okay. And when society does that, friends, stay with me. You know when society starts making wicked things good, no one's going to repent of those wicked things because after all, they're, they're, they're fine. Nothing wrong with them. You say, well, James, what does deviant mean? Deviant, it used to be anything from cheating on your spouse to cheating on tests in school, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, pedophilia, homosexuality, serial uh, killers. All those things were deviant behaviors. It used to be that we looked at individuals who were outside the norm and we said, you know what, that's deviant behavior. But now, man, you go to places like San Francisco and people got, they got hair spiked up to here and they got all kinds of body tattoos and they, they're running around with uh, uh, people of the same sex and they're dressing like women Men dressing like women and women dressing like men and you can't tell if it's a boy or a girl or what it is. And oh, that's acceptable now. We, we, live, in a, we live in a society that's made deviance acceptable. Now you know that's the case. You know that's the case. We live in a society that says, go ahead, be your own person. You know, we're, ju uh, we're not judgmental. I heard heard uh, Charles Rort talking to Bob Lawson the other day on the bus. Bob's going out to California. Going out to California. Well, they're not as judgmental out there. Yeah, you're right. That's the land of deviants out there. They're deviant. And we, and we, we look at all of it and go, well, you know, what are we going to do? See, we, we can't say anything about wickedness and sin 
Because society says, no, we're going to accept it. And then you wonder, well, why don't people change? I'll tell you why. Because society says it's okay. Look, friends, think about it. Think about it. We used to be a society that had a high moral standard, and if someone was involved in deviant behavior, it was hush-hush. Look, you know, it was kind of kept quiet. It was in the closet, right? It was behind closed doors, as the song used to say. But now, oh, now we out in the open, see? President John F. Kennedy having all these flings with all these women. Yeah, we didn't talk about that. But now, years down the line, now, you know, we have presidents out there having all kinds of crude and lewd relations with an intern in the Oval Office. And, oh, well, he's a great guy. It's deviant. This is what the late Senator Patrick, Daniel Patrick Moynihan said, and he wasn't a... Um, uh, he wasn't a conservative thinker by any stretch of the imagination on, on most things, but this is what he said. He said, over the past generation, the amount of deviant behavior in American society has increased beyond the levels the community can afford to recognize. He says, accordingly, we have been redefining deviancy so as to exempt much conduct previously stigmatized and also quietly raising the normal levels in categories where behavior is now abnormal by any earlier standard. See, what we've been doing, in other words, what we've been doing, we've been taking all the, the, the crazy and wild and wacko stuff that people used to say, man, you know, that guy's way out there and say, well, this is the norm now. It's the normal for society. See, now you have gay parades, right? Now you have, you know, abortion rallies. See, now you have, well, if, you're, if, if you uh, uh, talk about uh, anybody, look at them crossway, they're funny. Well, you know what, now you're in trouble. It's a hate crime. Listen, you don't think it's, you don't think it's a bad in our society? Look at this. You know this guy, this guy been in the news, Roman Polanski. He's a he's a oh, he's a great director. He's a Hollywood director. He's a rapist. Child rapist, convicted of of raping a child and then and then runs off to to Europe, runs off to France. And now, now that he's being now that he's being uh, uh, sentenced, now that he's getting his come up Everybody's coming to his side, coming to his aid. Who? All the wackos. Martin Scorsese, director in Hollywood. Woody Allen, of all people. Does it really surprise you? The deviant people in our society are supporting the deviant person in our society? I was amazed at all the people that have come out supporting this guy. Oh, well, you know, that was a long time ago. <laughs> well, you want know the only thing that's changed is time, friends. The only thing that's changed is time. What was deviant back then, still deviant today. You got judges that are letting pedophiles go, right? Sentencing them to two or three months in, in jail. And we say, well, what's happened to our society? I'll tell you what's happened to our society. Part of it is, part of it is stuff like the church, the churches, if you will, the things, the the ones that should be the the beacon of light and beacon of hope. Look what Paul said in Second uh, Timothy three, in verse fifteen. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. First Timothy three, in verse fifteen. I'll get it in a minute. Here it is. The church, the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth, it ought to be the case that the church, and everybody says, well, we're all one big church. Okay, if that's really the case, how come you're not holding up the truth like you should be? 
How come you're not really condemning wickedness and immorality like you should be? You know how I know the church is not doing it? Because the church is promoting it. There is a so-called Christian network in Martinsville that advertises the sale of alcohol, and now everybody gets mad. Ah, oh, you're just picking on them. Oh, really? I thought they were going to be the Christian network. They were going to make great changes in, 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 our, in our community. Right? You got people that come bringing in the, the gambling and the casinos, and who cries out against it? Who cries out against it? We talk about pubs and drinking on this program, and what happens? Oh, well, you know, the, the owner of the pub calls in and says, well, I go to church on Sunday when I don't have to work too late. How does the church feel about individuals who are engaged in that kind of activity? Oh, well, it's the norm. It's what's normal now. You don't believe it's a problem? Look at this. This is from, uh, this was from uh, Channel, Channel 2. Channel 2 News, not too long, let's say, I think it was yesterday. Listen to what, listen to what uh, the report is. Let me get down here to it. Just a sec. How's that? A long way. There are still laws on the books that are discriminatory. For instance, the majority of the states in the country, um, it is still so perfectly it legal to not hire someone simply because they're LGBT. And speakers from three different religious faiths. Here at home, we saw crowds of people participating in the National Coming Out Day interfaith celebration. The Faith Coalition of the Winston-Salem Chapter of Parents, Families, and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, that is PFLAG, hosted this event. While there have been some legislative changes in favor of gay unions, activists say there's more to be done. There still is... A long way to go. There are still laws on the books that are discriminatory. For instance, the majority of the states in the country, uh, it is still perfectly legal to not hire someone simply because they're LGBT. And speakers from three different religious faiths talked about the importance of ending discrimination toward gay and transgender people. All right. So are you one of those all good of really cutting down the cost on my power bill? If you uh, uh, speak out against gay and lesbian and transgender people, uh, you're a bad person. Well, I say that what it is, it's the, the churches doing what they should be doing and opposing such lifestyle is they're accepting it. And it's becoming a problem. The Presbyterians have a problem with it. The Episcopalians have a problem with it. The Methodists have a problem with it. Why? Because they won't have a stand against it. Because society... Society is saying, well, we're going to move the, the, the abnormal level and we're going to raise it up here to where it's actually normal now. No. If that's the way it's going to happen, society is going to be in a big old mess. See? See what society does? Society looks at, at problems and they call them sickness. So we look at the sin and we say, well, it's not really a sin. We call it a sickness. And what this does, friends, it makes, pe it makes repenting hard because we've changed. We've changed what is evil and what's wicked to something that is so benign and so, uh, you know, it's, just, it's, it's more le le harmless, more or less. Here's what Daryl Strawberry said, baseball player. He said addiction is a sickness. His wife stated, Daryl is not a bad person trying to do good. He's a sick person trying to get well. This is right after he'd been on a four-day cocaine binge. And he's sick? How about he's got an addiction? How about that's a sin? How about this is a problem that's more than just a sickness? Listen, Robert Downey Jr. told a judge as he was struggling, that he was struggling with an illness and should not be punished for behavior that is beyond his control. You mean to tell me that you don't have control? Well, if you don't have control, that's a sin. The Bible says self-control. It's something that, 
that everybody ought to have in their life. And you're telling me, well, it, it's, it's, an, it's just a sickness. You know, I'm not to blame for my behavior. Now, why would anybody want to repent for simply a sickness? Go ahead and put the phone lines up, Matt. I'm sorry. Please. Why would anybody want to repent for sickness? See? Listen, people don't repent for sickness. Some of you out there are watching. You may be laid up in the bed and you're watching this and, and you've got the flu. Listen, you don't repent for having the flu. You may, you may be involved in sin and that may be what got you sick. So you sin might have caused you to get the AIDS virus. Sin might have caused you to get hepatitis because you've been using dirty needles. Yeah. Sin might cause you to have cirrhosis of the liver. Right? Yeah. See, sin might have caused you to have all these kind of organ failures because you've been putting something in your body that you shouldn't been or you've been living in such a way, giving your years to the devil, as the, as the, uh, uh, as the wise man said in Proverbs, that may be what have caused you sickness. But, but, the, but the sickness is not the sin. Sickness is caused by the sin. And so what we have to do is we have to realize, you know what? We need to get back to defining Bible things the way the Bible defines them. Not whitewashing them, sugarcoating them, smoothing over them, making them feel good. Who's going to repent when they're, when they're sick? See? But if we start redefining biblical terms and calling sin by these, you know, these little uh, benign words like, well, it's not a homosexuality, you're not effeminate, it's not abuse of themselves of mankind, it's, it's more, well, it's, it's gay. There ain't nothing gay about it, friends. There's nothing happy about it. In the end, it won't be anyway. The pleasure of sin may be. Uh, nice for a season, but in the end they won't be, they won't be uh, uh, happy. They won't be, they won't be uh, good. See, you see how we we hinder the command by redefining what sin really is. All right, I'll take it. You're on the word from the Lord. You know, you you and. Uh I created it. It's the only ones I see of it. Talk about Kevin 21. So, bad. y'all must watch it 24 7. So, what's your point? Huh? So, do you, do you think a Christian network ought to be promoting the selling of alcohol? You must watch are you, 24 are you, 7. I, I heard you comment. Are you a Christian? That, that's not your business. Are you a Christian? Are you, let me ask you a question. Are you one? Yes, I am. Are you one? I don't think you. I don't think you are. Are you one? Now I answered your question. Go ahead and answer. Are you a Christian? Oh, your listeners. Are, are you listening. a Christian, sir? You're nothing but a crook, sir. Are you a Christian? I go ahead and hang up. I, I wish you would. Go ahead. <clears throat> All right. Now see, now, now why is it that a man won't say he's a Christian? Or not I say he's not. Most people would readily say yes, they're a Christian. But the problem is, see, he's got trouble. He's got trouble when you start talking about sin. Listen, if you've, got, if you've got a problem when someone starts talking about sin, that shows right there that you are not looking for the truth. You don't really like that standard. You don't want to be held to that standard. You want all the standards to go away so that no one can say you're doing wrong. You're on the word of the Lord. Buddy, I got no trouble with you. I'm just trying to so why don't you answer the question then? Are you a Christian? You hear what I said? I heard what you said. Are you a Christian? I said, I'm trying to be down at BCW 21. I said, are you a Christian? Well, that's none of your business. Yeah, I am. Are you? Yes, I am. Are, so, are you? so you now you're a, a Christian. You're a Christian. Do you, think, do you think a Christian network, do you think a Christian network ought to be promoting the selling of alcohol? Do you think a Christian network ought to be promoting the selling of alcohol? You own a channel that does the same thing. What's the difference? The channel I'm on what? does not profess to be a Christian station. Do you not see the difference? You're not perfect. Do you not see the difference, sir? No, I don't. You don't see the difference in a station that says we're a Christian network Amen. and one that doesn't claim to be a Christian network? The only reason you ain't You don't see the difference, sir? If I, you don't see the difference because you don't want to want to see it. Did you hear what I said? No, I didn't. If you ain't on it, it's because they won't let people like you on it. I know they won't. They would rather have the beer oh. and alcohol. Right they would rather have the drunks 
and the promoting of things that are harmful to society oh, on their, on their program. Like they would rather have the things that tear down society rather than the things that promote good and wholesome living. And here they're, they're saying that they are the, the family network. Now, which is, which is really the, uh, uh, more Christ-like? You're in the word of the Lord. Yeah, do you think people choose to be gay? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, that's simple enough. I believe they choose to be gay. They have to choose to be gay. Why would God condemn a lifestyle and then make someone that way? That would be, that would be the, the simple answer. I mean, they have to choose. Now, they may be conditioned by their environment to make that choice, but nonetheless, it is a, it is a choice that they make. But see what happens when you, start, when you start calling sin what it really is? Society will get upset because they want... You know, they don't want to be condemned. The easiest way to make sure that you're not condemned is to change the definition. Change the definition. So that it's not sinful anymore. I mean, that's easy enough to do. It's easy enough to pacify your mind that way. Well, it's not really sinful. We'll just change the definition, see? It's not adultery anymore. It's, well, we're just having a little affair. We're having a little flame here. We love each other. Well, that's not what the Bible calls it. The Bible calls it adultery. The Bible calls it whoremongering. So when we change the definition, we make it look better, and then we don't feel so bad about it. You're on the word from the Lord. Hey, I'd like to talk to James, please. This is he. You're on there. Hey, James. Hey. You're having an excellent program tonight. Just wanted to call in and let you know that. Wh where are you calling from? I'm calling from Bryson City. All right. All right, watching on the internet. Good, good, uh, good to hear your voice. Okay, thank you for calling. All right, bye. Bye. All right. So, but you see how it works? Change the definition. Change the definition, and you make things not so bad. But isn't what the devil did? See, the devil makes the sinful things unsinful. When Satan came to the garden, and uh, he was trying to tempt Eve, that's exactly what he did. He said, "God knows." God knows that you're going to become like, uh, like him. Look at this. He said, God doesn't know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's, knowing good from evil. He made the thing that God said don't do appeal in such a way that, that Eve did it. You're on the word of the Lord. Yes, I think the Bible is a fairy tale. Okay. It needs to be burned and removed from the planet forever so everyone can finally be free. Thank you. Okay. All right. And I, I can tell that you... Uh, there's, there's a classic example of evolution. I think we just found the missing link right there. Uh, <clears throat> okay. The people, that, the people that want freedom, don't want to be oppressed, are the ones that are saying, let's burn the Bible. Okay. You know what? I mean, if that doesn't if that doesn't show you the closed-mindedness of the of this open-minded person, I would assume he's a he's a free thinker. Probably what he would say, you know, is the one who says let's let's burn the Bible. Okay. So um, anyway, but yeah, I think we found a missing link there. So let's make sin, uh, you know, unsinful. You're on the word from the Lord. Uh, yes, I uh, was. I'm watching on the internet too, by the way. And I okay. A member of the Church of Christ, and I agree with everything you're saying. But uh, I was wondering, could you comment on First uh, John chapter five, verse uh, seventeen, which says, "There is a sin not unto death." Okay, I will. Uh, I, I'm trying to stay on on topic, but I'll try to get over here right quick to it. First John five seventeen. Uh, yeah. I, well, I, I was thinking maybe this was on the topic. You know, okay. Because somebody might wondering about that scripture there. Uh. There, there is a sin not unto death. Yes. The, all sin, in other words, let's, let's back up uh, a few verses. Now, of course, we're talking to individuals who are members of the church. They're, they're Christians. And John says, if we know that he hear us, what's where we ask, we know that we have petitions that are desired of him. Individuals that are on communication with God and are in, in good standing with God don't have any sin standing between them and God. God hears their prayers. If any man see a brother, sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. 
there is a sin unto death. Whoops. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that you should pray for it. Verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. The only sin, or let's say this, the sin that is not unto death is a sin that is repented of. And if someone refuses to repent and they die in their sins, Jesus said if you, you can't go to where he is. If you die in your sins, you cannot be where he is. So the, the sin unto death is a sin that is not repented of. But anybody, as long as they're alive, they have the opportunity to repent of their sins. And that's the sin that God will forgive. Someone will repent, do what he says to remove those sins. Uh, there's a sin. That's the sin not unto death. The only sin, the unpardonable sin, you might say, uh, as far as we're concerned today, is a sin that is not repented of. Is that, you think that helped? Yeah, that's, yeah I, I agree 100% okay. with that. I just uh, thought I'd call out and let you know I was watching on the Internet. Right, where are you calling from? Don't mind me asking. Illinois. Illinois. Okay. All right. Good to hear you. Thanks Thank for watching. You. All right. You're on the word from the Lord. Hey, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. Well, God bless you. Uh, the man before the last that said we ought to burn the Bible. Yes, ma'am. I would like to tell him that maybe he needs to get on his knees and pray to God because God may say he don't know him. And then he's going to find out what hell really is. Right. Well, I'll tell you what. There's no atheist in hell. Well, he don't belong to CNN on TV in front of our kids. Well, you know what? I don't mind people like that saying that because, because here's the thing. The truth can withstand the attack. You oh, know? yeah. But when, when we start examining what, uh, you know, what, what the atheists and agnostics have to offer, if, if they'll even offer it, you know, then... Uh, you start seeing pretty clearly, you know, the truth. The, the you know the real the real truth comes out. So uh, I'm gonna speak myself, <clears throat> but I thank God every morning that He wakes, lets me wake up down here. I know I got a better place waiting, but I, you know, if my heart goes out to Him right now, worse than in my own self. Right. I thank God that He forgives me, even though we're all still sinners. You know, we're none of us is perfect, but evidently he really does need some help. Right. Well, that's why we're that's why we're 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 glad to be on the air. Yes, I am too. Well, thanks for watching. You have a good night. You too, sir. All right. All right. You're on the work of the Lord. Yeah, I got a message for the gentleman who wanted to burn all the Bible so he could be free. Mm-hmm. Uh, he needs to uh, heed the message tonight and repent. Then he can find real freedom. All right, that's true. That's true. All right. I, I'm I'm pretty sure he's still watching. All right. Thanks for your call. All right. You on the word from the Lord? Hello, um, Mr. Olson. Um, yes, ma'am. Could you tell me how long that um, Job was um, afflicted by Satan? How long Job was afflicted? Yes, sir. Does the Bible state it? Um, How long? I, I don't know that it gives a definite number of days. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't really know. I know I know his friends sat with him seven days without you know without talking. So uh, uh, you know, I don't really know. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. I, I'm sorry. All right. Mm -hmm. You're on work with the Lord. Hey, James. Hey. I just wanted to comment on that guy that's burning all the all the Bibles out of that Baptist church. Right. I was wondering if they going to burn their creed books. That's what they need to burn, isn't it? Yep, that's what it says in the Bible. Uh, I believe we can find uh, that. Is that man in, was that man in where, Canton, North Carolina? I, I believe it was. Yeah, I believe it was too. Canton, North Carolina. Uh, Amazing Grace Baptist Church. They're going to burn all the, all the, uh, I guess like the NIVs, the any Bible that wasn't a King James Bible, and some of the books by Christian authors like uh, Rick Warren and Billy Graham and uh, uh, Joyce Myers, which I agree, though they, you know, if if you want to, if you're going to burn something, you know, why not burn those books? 
So they're certainly not helping people. But yeah, then, uh, I'm just waiting to see if they're going to burn that uh, Baptist Creek book out they got. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I doubt they'll burn that. The Baptist Faith and Message or the Hiscox Manual or anything like that. Yeah. If they do that, they won't be Baptist. All right, brother. Okay. Take care of that. All right. We'll see you. Uh-huh. All right. You're on the word from the Lord. Hello. How you doing? I'm doing well. All right. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not unto death. Okay, well, what? It, okay, everybody's born into sin, right? I'm sorry. Everyone is born in sin, right? No. So when you're born, you're not born in sin. No. Well, could you explain that scripture there for me? This scripture right here? Yes, sir. I, I just did explain it. There's a sin not unto death. I, I just turned it a, off. A sin video. that's not repented of is the sin that's not unto death. But if you don't repent of a sin, then it's going to be, it's going to condemn you. Okay, what, what, the reason I asked that question is like, when babies are born, right, they're born into sins, right? No. So they already filled with the Holy Ghost and everything, right? No. They're going to heaven. They're going to heaven. They're safe. They're safe. Yeah. No sin laid to their charge. Do you think a baby's born in sin? I thought the Bible said everyone was born into sin. No. Do you think do you think that when a, a child is born that that he's a sinner? Until they get saved, yes. So what if they die in infancy? What well, if they die in infancy, they it's up to God to judge the you know, when uh So you think there's some babies that die that God's gonna say you're a sinner going to hell? And some babies that he says come on them to heaven? No. What I'm saying is, the Bible say everyone is born in sin, right? No. Well, I got. It doesn't say we're all born in sin. So what? It doesn't say that. Well, what does it say about sin? It. I I, I don't know. You know when you're born. Right. The Bible doesn't say we're born in sin. I'm just I'm just telling you that's you're asking me if that's true, and I'm saying no, it's not true. So when do babies get saved? I'm sorry. When do babies get saved? Babies get saved when they grow up and become men and women. That's who were saved in the New Testament. So Acts when, 8 verse 12, men and women. But you got to have the knowledge and understanding of what the Bible is talking about, right? Right. you and, got to have a knowledge of what the Scripture is. And a baby doesn't have that. That's right. A baby can't repent. Right, that's right. So if a baby can't repent and he dies, he's got to go to hell. But, okay. Is that what you're saying? Two years old, right? Is that what you're saying? If a, ba- if a baby is two years old, right? Okay. And he tells a lie, right? Okay. Okay. And he don't. He's not. Uh, he don't know what he's doing. I mean, he, you know, he don't understand the Bible, so right? Is that a sin? Is it? I I, I don't know. I don't think it is. You don't think it's a sin? I, a, I don't. I don't think it's a sin that's going to be laid to his account. But the okay. So ten commandments don't mean anything, right? I'm sorry. The tenth commandments. The tenth commandment? Yeah. It, <laughs> That that shall not lie. Yeah, that that means something. But just because, just because someone violates a law, does that mean they're going to be held accountable to it? Okay. Well. Okay. Well, Here's what, let, well, I'm running out of time. Let me just use this illustration. Okay. If I ahead. take my child to the store and my child steals something, right? You know who's going to get in trouble? Who? Oh. Me. I don't I'm going to have to give so. an account for it. I if, think if it, God is, if, if it, if it's, is an individual. I don't think that's right. You know, I don't if think it's an account. Knows. If it's a case where, where a, a child is caught doing something, right? They're not held accountable, even by our laws. They're they're given charge to either the parents, or you know, someone is, uh, 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 is accountable to that person. Now, there's going to come a time when that child is going to grow up, and they're going to be accountable for their own actions. And I say God's, God's the same way. Yeah, but I don't so, think God would uh, account you for that sin because you're two different people, I, right? I know, I know that, but I'm saying God doesn't lay it to their charge. It's my responsibility to raise my children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, teach them right from wrong, right. teach them to love God, love their fellow man, obey, and obey the laws of the land, so forth like that, to, to raise them up. And then... When they become men, uh, men and women, then they're going to be accountable to God. But until that time, God does not lay a sin to their charge. That's just like if 
If, if a child lies... That, that, that's like you can take a water to a mule to the water, but you can't make them drink. Okay. Raise your kid, but you can't, you're not accountable for what they do after they get grown. I know. That's right. I know, but I'm saying when they're, when they're infants. If your child, if, if a ch- I'm going to say your child, but if a child lies, two-year-old child lies, and then they die, are, are they going to go to hell? No. So then, why, so why would you hold to a doctrine that says they're born in sin? Because then you have to come up with Bible another. Somewhere. Then you have to come up with another doctrine that says, "Well, God forgives them, even though they're sinners." How about just saying God doesn't hold that sin to their charge until they they reach a, an age when they are going to be accountable to God? Okay, that, that's easy. Way. I tell you what, if you want a copy of of a good debate on uh, born in sin. Uh, Johnny Robertson and, and uh, Dan Parker did about I don't know three or four nights debate on uh, on born in sin. Right. Okay. Let me ask you another question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. I'm, I'm way over. I, I got to go. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks for your call. All right, friends. Got to go. Sorry, sorry. There's some good calls tonight, but uh, uh, here's the point: if if uh, if a person doesn't repent of their sins, they're going to be lost. That's the that's a sin that you can't get over. And uh, uh, repentance is a, is a hard command. It's a hindered command because we make the the, uh, uh, the sin, we dumb down the sin to where people don't feel, don't feel bad about it. But the bottom line is you're going to have, you're going to, have to repent. It, it's got to be the command that you have to obey. And if we can assist you in obeying the gospel at the church that, that meets at 250 the Boulevard, Please let me know. Here's how you can reach me, 276-340-2653 or wordmylord at gmail.com. Until next time, friends, thanks for watching, and always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? If you want to find people who are studying God's Word, come examine the Church of Christ. We're meeting right here at 250 The Boulevard in downtown Eden. If you want to hear more plain Bible teaching, watch A Word from the Lord Thursday nights at 9 o'clock right here on WGSR.